Um, first of all, I take offense at the remark that this is a corrupt decision. This is a charge that the Supreme Court of the United States, in its legitimate role in interpreting the laws of the United States, has made a corrupt decision. I would like to know which of the justices was corrupted in this decision, which was paid off, which was somehow influenced in an improper way to reach this decision. I think this is outrageous and un unbecoming this House to call a Supreme Court decision corrupt. I also would believe that this decision, which is now the law of the land, is being railed against now in a manner that sounds to me like nullification. I've heard others speak in recent months about how they disagree with federal law and speak about how nullification or the equivalent of nullification is the remedy. How we ought to decide which federal laws we want to abide by and which we don't want to abide by. Well, Mr. Speaker, I submit that that was settled at Gettysburg and the federal law is the supreme law of the land and that law is interpreted by the Supreme Court of the United States. The earlier decision in 1908 may be a venerable decision, but not necessarily the correct decision. Many decisions which last for years in our Supreme Court were later repudiated. I can I re recall immediately Plessy versus Ferguson, which was years and years the law of this country, and finally repudiated in Brown against Board of Education. I also think of Dred Scott, which was the law of this land for years until the abhorrent doctrine set forth in that decision was finally repudiated by our Supreme Court and our Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, the decision in, United, in Citizens United was the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States and therefore the law of the land. I would note that this opportunity presided, provided by Citizens United uh, gives every side represented by an entity the opportunity to express itself. Corporations, unions, other entities. Was this the intent of the original founders? I don't know. I don't know how the original founders felt about corporations. But, you know, we are constantly told that our Constitution is a living, breathing, growing document, and therefore we have to adopt it to the times. Well, the times are such that our Supreme Judicial Court has determined that entities like corporations and unions have a right to speak. It's far different than it was in the time of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who, during whose time uh, trusts and combinations of corporations ruled our economy when unions were not allowed to have the access to negotiation that they do now, that the rights of our workers were not recognized. But now we have a much more equal balance in our society and we can well afford to let both sides have an opportunity to speak. Disclosure, I don't necessarily agree with all of the disclosure that is provided in this bill, or this amendment which has become the bill, but it is fair to regulate the disclosure uh, of the supporters who have an opportunity now to speak under Citizens United. It's an interesting irony, isn't it, that a corporation, if it's simply a corporation, is not to speak. Is not to speak. But if it owns, if it owns a media corporation, then it can speak. The New York Times Corporation can speak in its editorials, can take positions, can endorse candidates, and that's all right. That's all right if it's a media corporation, but not if it's a business corporation that doesn't print a newspaper or operate a radio station or a television station. 
What is it about a media uh, corporation that gives it a special privilege and an opportunity to speak? I guess that if corporations, business corporations, were sufficiently uh, uh, motivated, they might start a subsidiary that's a, that is a media corporation that publishes a newspaper or broadcasts radio st uh, messages or television shows, and then it can speak. Then it can speak. But not if it's just a business corporation, not if a corporation that employs thousands of workers and upon whose success thousands of workers depend, and who has a, and, and a corporation which has a vital interest in their economy and the public policy of this state and this country, no, they can't speak. Well, our court has held that they can speak, and unions can speak. And in the great marketplace of ideas, they both should speak. And I have no problem with proper disclosure, so we know who's speaking. But let's not say that we're going to attempt to nullify the decision of our court or maintain that it's corrupt, where such is not worthy of this body. Mr. Speaker, I have to respond to that. I'm going to vote in favor of adopting this amendment because I think it should be properly before the House, no matter what the final decision may be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.